All right, so this is going to be the review session for the last normal exam in Micro 1. Um, so this exam is going to basically be over all of the grandpa's rods that we've learned, Haemophilus and Neisseria, so the fastidious bacteria that we had like two weeks on fastidious bacteria, and then the grandpa's rods. Plus, there might be some other stuff just from previous. Um, in this exam as well. You'll kind of get the gist of it when we go through the PowerPoint. But before I share my screen and start on the PowerPoint, I'm just going to give you some info on the exam itself. So the exam is worth 54 points. 35 of those points are going to be multiple choice questions. So once again, the majority of the exam is multiple choice. You do have a few matching and a couple like short answer essay kind of questions here as well. So a little bit of variety on this one. All right, so now that we've talked about that, let me share my screen so we can do the PowerPoint. So I did email this PowerPoint out um, to you guys, so you should all have it to look at while we go through this. And yeah, I'm going to leave it like this. All right, so we're going to start with the grandpa's rods that we kind of covered. So these are some of them. Now there's a lot more than just these, obviously, but these are probably the majority of them. I think we don't have Nicardia streptomyces. We'll mention those later on. But let's just get started on these. So gram stain, we're going to start with Bacillus anthracis. So gram stain is, of course, grandpa's rod. And remember, Bacillus is spore forming. So I'm going to put spore plus for spore forming. So both Bacillus are going to be that way. So we can just label both of them like that. Remember, bacillus are very large grandpa's rods. They're the ones that we nickname um, boxcars. My mind is like blank today. Yeah, boxcars. So they're very, very large kind of in your face grandpa's rods when you view them on the gram stain. So as far as biochemical testing, they are catalase positive. Oh my gosh, cannot type. Okay. As far as bacillus anthracis goes, this one is non-hemolytic for colony morphology. I know that's not really a test, but we still want to mention that. And they are non-modal, but they are lecithinase positive on egg yolk agar. Disease obviously causes anthrax. Remember, the other name for anthrax is wool sorter's disease. And that is from the fact that bacillus anthracis actually can be found in the soil. And the animals grazing the soil can pick it up, the spores especially, into their fur and stuff like that, or wool, or whatever you want to call it. Um, remember, anthrax does have three different forms. It has the whole uh, um, inhalation, the skin, cutaneous, and then the GI form. The other thing I want you to make sure you note on bacillus anthracis is on the colony morphology, we already mentioned it's non-hemolytic, but also it has those very large medusa head shaped or sometimes you can call it comma projections to the colonies so very unique there they tend to be very really sticky when you try to kind of pick them up as well all right but so serious is beta hemolytic it is modal and it is also less of an ace positive this one causes just two diseases that i want you to take away food poisoning and eye infections The other with this one is these are also very large colonies. They are said to be more spreading. They don't really have that Medusa head look, so they're a little different there. These are also, I guess you could have listed this under biochemical testing, but I ran out of room. Um, penicillin resistant, whereas anthrax, remember, is penicillin susceptible. All right, Crinibacterium diphtheriae is a grandpa's rod. This is the one that has the unique look with Chinese letters, or they can take the V or L. Um, letter shape. They can also be what they call palisading, where they're lined up side by side. So some really unique things there. This uh, for the big biochemical test I want you to remember with Crinibacterium diphtheriae is that brown halo on Tinsdale auger. So they get that halo on Tinsdale auger. There's a few other augers that you can use to grow out Crinibacterium diphtheriae, cysteine telluride was one, and then Leffler's was the other. Not all of these are really that commonly used, but I still want you to remember them. And of course, this big disease that this causes is diphtheria, what it's named for. So that's that membrane on the back of the throat that kind of blocks the airway. 
and thankfully we have the DTaP vaccination to help prevent it. Listeria monocytogenes is a grandpa's rod. This one is, oh my, what am I doing? <laughs> is beta hemolytic when it grows out on the auger. The big characteristic of listeria is its motility. Remember it has either a tumbling motility if you do a wet mount or if you do a different test, it has that umbrella shape. And of course, this causes, well, we call it listeriosis, but remember, hugely meningitis, especially in neonates. That's why pregnant women have to stay away from certain foods. You guys have all, some, a lot of you did a case study on this, which is awesome. And so I hopefully that pounds at home, that information, so that it's easy to remember that one. Erysipelothrix rhizopathiae is a grandpa's rod. Oh, I should mention on Listeria that it is camp positive, hip urate positive as well. I should just mention that. And it is catalase positive. Okay. Erythipolovix rhizopathiae, um, it is a gram rod. This is the one that can form H2S, which is like a black precipitation in TSI auger. Uh, we'll talk more about TSI auger in micro two. That's more of an auger we use for the gram negatives. But if you were to place this organism into that TSI auger, it will make a black precipitate known as TS H2S production, hydrogen sulfide production. And this is the only grandpa's rod that can do that. Um, disease, it causes what it's named for, erysipeloids, which are basically skin ulcers infections, so a very severe skin infection. And this comes from handling animals, especially like I, like I said in the lecture, I always attribute it to pigs, but a variety of animals. I am like all over the place today, I'm sorry. <laughs> Gardnerella vaginalis, another grandpa's rod. Um, this is the one that forms clue cells. Remember, those are the squamous epithelial cells filled with the Gardnerella vaginalis bacteria. You can find them in either urine or if a doctor does a vaginal swab, what we call a wet prep, you can see them under the microscope there. And of course, this is named for what it does, bacterial vaginosis, so a vaginal infection, a bacterial vaginal infection. There's not much else you have to worry about this. I think you can grow it on a tween auger if you wanted as well. Okay, that was all of them, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay, so that's a little bit of a summary. Again, go back to the original lecture or the original PowerPoint, relook through. I might have missed something here and there. I'm just trying to quickly summarize, gather some of the big points of these items, but you can always go back, make sure that you add on anything else that I might have missed to this. All right, a couple questions. A catalase positive grandpa's rod that is not acid fast, does not branch, and does not form spores could possibly belong to which group of bacteria? So I'm not going to make anybody that's on here answer. I'll answer it. So if you want, pause it, find your answer, and then let's discuss. So my answer for this question is going to be Carinibacterium. So let's go through it. Carinibacterium is catalase positive. If these are all, the first three are all grandpa's rods. Mycobacterium, we haven't discussed this yet. We can discuss it next quarter. Um, but that, it doesn't really gram stain. It's, um, it's more of an acid fast positive. So by the question saying not acid fast, that rules out Mycobacterium right away. Does not branch, rules out actinomyces, because remember that does branch. Does not form spores, that rules out bacillus, because that does form spores. So the only choice you have left is bacterium. Which grandpa's rod produces hydrogen sulfide when inoculated into TSI auger? We just discussed this. Again, you can pause it if you want to find your answer, but the answer is going to be erysipelothrix. Non-acid fast aerobic actinomyces include which? So again, pause. Okay, so we're gonna go with non-acid fast is going to be streptomyces. All of these are kind of like actinomyces. Nicardia though, remember, and we didn't really discuss much on Rhodococcus gordonia, we just mentioned them, but these ones are considered partially acid fast. Whereas streptomyces, remember, was non-acid fast. Induction of sporulation by bacillus can be accomplished with what? 
take a minute. All right, and this should be urea auger. I would, would, would remember this question. And same with this question. Definitely should highlight these. Induction of capsule formation by bacillus enteresis can be accomplished with, and in this case, it's bicarbonate auger. Um, so these you could have also thrown up here on our chart. I knew that we were going to have a question on them. That's why I didn't mention them. So, and the way that I remember these, because to me they're easily confused, I always try to remember the C in capsule with the C in bicarb, and then I just know the other one has to be urea. I don't know. Use whatever you can to help remember. All right, so here's a little, there is a reason the slide is here. This is where, like I said in the beginning, where we can have a, a little bit of info from previous weeks on this exam, and so this would be a good example. So I want you to state the gram stain characteristic of the following. So let's just go through each one. Strep A. galactiae, you should be right away thinking to yourself, gram pos coxi. And we know that strep tend to chain. So you should be thinking gram pos coxi chaining. Staph aureus, gram pos coxi clusters. Corinibacterium diphtheriae, we already mentioned it, but it's gram pos rods. And remember, Chinese letters, V or L shapes, palisading, any of those unique features with the gram pos rods for Corinibacteria. Bacillus cereus, gram pos rods, spore forming, very large, what we call box cars. Strep pneumoniae, gram pos coxi, and in fact, you should be thinking gram pos diplo coxi. And so they occur in pairs, and those are the ones that are tending to be cat eye shaped or what we call lancet shaped. And then finally, nocardia, gram pos rods and these branch. So just hopefully none of that was new information. I hope that you guys can all go through that easily and do that at this point. For diseases, this should be also something that you should easily be able to do at, by now, especially on the grand pass coxies. We've discussed those. We just had an unknown lab on them um, last week in week eight. Like, these should hopefully be review. So going through, I know I'm going to talk fast if you need, just pause it so you can write things out. Strep A. galactiae, the biggest thing here is neonatal meningitis. Strep pyogenes, of course the first one that comes to mind is strep throat because that's group A strep. Um, but also scarlet fever, um, lots of skin stuff like impetigo, scalded skin syndrome, toxic shock syndrome, um, Glomerulonephritis, rheumatic fever as complications of strep pyogenes infection. I mean, there's a lot you can list here. Cranibacterium diphtheriae, diphtheria, that should be like a given. Bacillus cereus, like we just mentioned earlier, food poisoning, eye infections. Strep pneumoniae would be obviously pneumonia. And then also meningitis, huge cause of meningitis. Listeria monocytogenes, also neonatal meningitis. Okay. Fastidious bacteria. So we discussed Haemophilus and Nicard or Nicardia, Haemophilus and Nicardia, and a couple others in the last couple weeks. So starting with Haemophilus, remember these are tiny gram-negative rods. They were the ones that I always called junk in the background because they are so small, it's easy to lose them and not see them right away. The reason hemophilus is facetious is it needs extra stuff to grow. It either wants an X factor, a V factor, sometimes both. Remember, the X factor is hemin, the V factor is NAD. You guys all filled out that study guide and answered that, so that should be, this whole thing came off the study guide, so this should be review for you. So going through the chart, try to fill, pause it, try to fill out the chart as you can on your own. All right, Haemophilus influenzae, remember, needs both X and V factor, and the disease it causes is um, lots of respiratory stuff, not influenza, though, what it's named for. But remember, this was a big one with meningitis, especially in young children, epiglottitis. Um, there's a subspecies, Aegypticus, that goes with pink eye. Um, there's all sorts of things that can go with this. Parainfluenzae only needs the V factor. And again, this is lots of respiratory type infections here as well. Ducreii only needs the X factor, and this is a STD. It causes what we call a shankroid, which is a big lesion on the genitalia. 
And then hemophilus apophilus is kind of the oddball out. It does not require X or V factors. And remember, this is part of that group called HASIC. Um, they're put together, this whole group of bacteria is put together because they all cause slowly progressive endocarditis. All right. That's kind of it for hemophilus. The other big thing with hemophilus is, remember, each one has a different oxidase reaction. Definitely should just take away that Haemophilus influenzae is very much oxidase positive. There you go. Um, oxidase is a test we always run. The very first test we run once we see we have a gram negative rod. Um, so gram negs always have oxidase done. So if you were to do Haemophilus influenzae, it should be oxidase positive. The others can kind of vary. So that's the one I'm most worried about for the oxidase reaction. All right, other facetious organisms out of this week was brucella, another gram neg rod, very much oxidase positive. And there's several species. This is a zoonotic infection. Brucellosis is a zoonotic infection. And so we need to make sure we link with our animal host for this. This is the one that needs a class three hood, sometimes used for bioterrorism. So we talked all about that in the original lecture that you can go back and revisit. But brucella, let's just go through these. Um, Brucella abortus is cattle or cows. Brucella suis, swine is pigs, so hopefully that's easy to remember. Melatensis is goats or sheep. And canis, hopefully it should be easy as well, is dogs. All right, Bordetella pertussis is the cause of whooping cough. This is also part of that DTAP vaccination that we all have now. There are special augers that are used to grow Bordetella, Borde, Gingo. The first word itself looks like Bordetella. Oh my God, what am I doing? Okay. Um, Regan Lowe would be another specialized auger to help grow Bordetella. Typically, when we are collecting a Bordetella pertussis sample, like if we're screening for Bordetella, we would do a nasopharyngeal swab, which is basically up the nose. It's like a tiny little swab up the nose. Oh, fun. Kind of brings a tear to the eye. All right, and then Francisella tularensis is a gram negative rod. By the way, Bordetella was also a gram negative rod. Um, tularensis causes tularemia. So this is another class three hood kind of situation used for bioterrorism. It's a zoonotic disease because it's very much linked with rodents, rabbits, beavers especially. So again, go back, relook at that original chapter PowerPoint to kind of refresh yourself on that. I think I left off um, Legionella. So Legionella is also part of this chapter. I mean, we just had a whole discussion post on that. So hopefully that whole discussion post really made you more familiar with Legionella and Legionnaire's disease. I also put up a, an announcement um, going over the discussion, my answers to it, a little bit of information on Legionnaire's disease versus the other disease that causes Pontiac fever, which we didn't really discuss in our lecture, but I wanted to give you that info. So again, it's always important to go back to the original PowerPoints, because when I do these exam review sessions, I only try to highlight certain things. That doesn't mean that this is everything. So there very much could be still questions on Legionella or something like that, that we haven't put in here on the test. So always go back to the chapter PowerPoints. And then the other, the week after that, we learned, or maybe it was the week before, it was the week after, we learned Neisseria and Maraxella catarallis. Again, these are gram-negative diplococci, so they occur in pairs. They're said to be shaped like kidney beans. And these are very much oxidase positive. So again, I said we always oxidase test after we see it's gram-negative, and so these would be oxidase positive. We answered already on the study guide, but you all know now that they have specialized augers for Neisseria growth, modified there, Martin, Martin Lewis, and New York City, um, NYC. I, I don't really talk a lot about NYC, but these two, the first two, modified there, Martin, and Martin Lewis, you should definitely know. Take a look at all the antibiotics in each one of those, what they inhibit. Um, be sure to know that. And then a, a, a interesting uh, tidbit on Maraxella catarallis is that, again, it has a hockey puck consistency on the auger, meaning that when you go to try to pick it up with your loop, it kind of slides across the auger like a hockey puck on ice. The big test result with Maraxella catarallis that we mentioned is, is very much DNA positive. Diseases, 
the beauty of these are they kind of look like what they cause. Neisseria meningitis, meningitis, especially in teenagers. Um, I actually just saw that commercial again for that meningococcal vaccine for teenagers to take. Um, I don't know if any of you have paid attention now. When you see it, you'll be like, oh, I know it. <laughs> Neisseria gonorrhea, gonorrhea. And then Rexat cataralis was huge with upper respiratory infections like ear infections, sinus infections, that kind of stuff. And then the big thing with Neisseria is the carbohydrate utilization or what you can call sugar use. So we need to remember these. Again, you already did a study guide on these, but let's just go through. Neisseria gonorrhea is glucose positive, but the rest it does not use. Neisseria meningitis will be glucose and maltose positive, but it won't use the last one. And lactamica, which we don't discuss much, it's not very pathogenic. But if you need to remember, it does use all three. So this helps separate which Neisseria species might be present. And then again, Maxella doesn't use any of these. That's where that DNA, DNA test will come in handy. Okay, so that is it. Um, if you guys have questions on anything before the test, as always, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer anything that you need. Um, so I think we are good. I don't think I have any further questions. Where's my, where's my room? Oh my God. I am like seriously not with it. Anyway, I'm gonna let you go because I'm not with it today. But if you need anything, give me a holler. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a great week. Thanks.